Chapter Three of Memoir of Jane Austen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoir of Jane Austen by James Edward Austen Lee. Chapter Three. Early Compositions. Friends at Ash. A Very Old Letter. Lines on the Death of Mrs. Lefroy. Observations on Jane Austen's Letter Writing. Letters. I know little of Jane Austen's childhood. Her mother followed a custom, not unusual in those days, though it seems strange to us, of putting out her babies to be nursed in a cottage in the village. The infant was daily visited by one or both of its parents, and frequently brought to them at the parsonage, but the cottage was its home, and must have remained so till it was old enough to run about and talk. For I know that one of them, in after life, used to speak of his foster mother as Movie the name by which he had called her in his infancy. It may be that the contrast between the parsonage house and the best class of cottages was not quite so extreme then as it would be now, that the one was somewhat less luxurious and the other less squalid. It would certainly seem from the results that it was a wholesome and invigorating system, for the children were all strong and healthy. Jane was probably treated like the rest in this respect. In childhood every available opportunity of instruction was made use of, According to the ideas of the time, she was well educated, though not highly accomplished, and she certainly enjoyed that important element of mental training, associating at home with persons of cultivated intellect. It cannot be doubted that her early years were bright and happy, living as she did with indulgent parents in a cheerful home, not without agreeable variety of society. To these sources of enjoyment must be added the first stirrings of talent within her, and the absorbing interest of original composition. It is impossible to say at how early an age she began to write. There are copy-books extant containing tales, some of which must have been composed while she was a young girl, as they had amounted to a considerable number by the time she was sixteen. Her earliest stories are of a slight and flimsy texture, and are generally intended to be nonsensical, but the nonsense has much spirit in it. They are usually preceded by a dedication of mock solemnity to some one of her family. It would seem that the grandiloquent dedications prevalent in those days had not escaped her youthful penetration. Perhaps the most characteristic feature in these early productions is that, however puerile the matter, they are always composed in pure simple English, quite free from the over-ornamented style which might be expected from so young a writer. One of her juvenile effusions is given as a specimen of the kind of transitory amusement which Jane was continually supplying to the family party. The Mystery, an Unfinished Comedy Dedication To the Reverend George Austin Sir, I humbly solicit your patronage to the following comedy, which, though an unfinished one, is, I flatter myself, as complete a mystery as any of its kind. I am, sir, your most humble servant, the author. The Mystery, a Comedy. Dramatis Persona. Men, Colonel Elliot, Old Humbug, Young Humbug, Sir Edward Spangle, and Corridan. Women, Fanny Elliot, Mrs. Humbug, and Daphne. Act One, Scene One, A Garden. Enter Corridan. Corridan. But hush, I am interrupted. Exit Corridan. Enter Old Humbug and his son, talking. Old Hum. It is for that reason that I wish you to follow my advice. Are you convinced of its propriety? Young Hum. I am, sir, and will certainly act in the manner you have pointed out to me. Old Hum. Then let us return to the house. Excellent. Scene 2. A parlour in Humbug's house. Mrs. Humbug and Fanny discovered at work. Mrs. Hum. You understand me, my love? Fanny. Perfectly, ma'am. Pray continue your narration. Mrs. Hum. Alas, it is nearly concluded— for I have nothing more to say on the subject. Fanny. Ah, here is Daphne. Enter Daphne. Daphne, my dear Mrs. Humbug, how do you do? Oh, Fanny, it is all over. Fanny. Is it indeed? Mrs. Hum. I'm very sorry to hear it. Fanny. Then t'was no purpose that I— Daphne. None upon earth. Mrs. Hum. And what is to become of— Daphne. Oh, tis all settles. Whispers to Mrs. Humbug. Fanny. And how is it determined? Daphne. I'll tell you, whispers Fanny. Mrs. Hum. And is he to— Daphne. I'll tell you all I know of the matter, whispers Mrs. Humbug and Fanny. Fanny. 
"'Well, now I know everything about it. I'll go away.' Mrs. Hum and Daphne. "'And so will I.' Excellent. Scene three. The curtain rises, and discovers Sir Edward Spangle reclined in an elegant attitude on a sofa, fast asleep. Enter Colonel Elliot. Colonel E. My daughter is not here, I see. There lies Sir Edward. Shall I tell him the secret? No, he'll certainly blab it. But he's asleep and won't hear me, so I'll even venture. Goes up to Sir Edward, whispers to him, and exits. End of the first act. Finney. Her own mature opinion of the desirableness of such an early habit of composition is given in the following words of a niece. As I grew older, my aunt would talk to me more seriously of my reading and my amusements. I had taken early to writing verses and stories, and I am sorry to think how I troubled her with reading them. She was very kind about it, and always had some praise to bestow, but at last she warned me against spending too much time upon them. She said, how well I recollect it, that she knew writing stories was a great amusement, and she thought a harmless one, though many people she was aware thought otherwise, but that at my age it would be bad for me to be much taken up with my own compositions. Later still, it was after she had gone to Winchester, she sent me a message to this effect, that if I would take her advice I should cease writing till I was sixteen, that she herself often wished she had read more and written less in the corresponding years of her own life. As this niece was only twelve years old at the time of her aunt's death, these words seem to imply that the juvenile tales to which have referred had, some of them at least, been written in her childhood. But between these childish effusions and the composition of her living works, there intervened another stage of her progress, during which she produced some stories, not without merit, but which she never considered worthy of publication. During this preparatory period her mind seems to have been working in a very different direction from that into which it ultimately settled. Instead of presenting faithful copies of nature, these tales were generally burlesque, ridiculing the improbable events and exaggerated sentiments which she had met with in sundry silly romances. Something of this fancy is to be found in Northanger Abbey, but she soon left it far behind in her subsequent course. It would seem as if she were first taking note of all the faults to be avoided, and curiously considering how she ought not to write, before she attempted to put forth her strength in the right direction. The family have, rightly, I think, declined to let these early works be published. Mr. Shortreed observed very pithily of Walter Scott's early rambles on the borders. He was making himself at the time, but he did not know, maybe, what he was about till years had passed. At first he thought of little, I dare say, but the queerness and the fun. And so in a humbler way Jane Austen was making her sell, little thinking of future fame, but caring only for the queerness and the fun, and it would be as unfair to expose this preliminary process to the world, as it would be to display all that goes on behind the curtain of the theatre before it is drawn up. It was, however, at Steventon that the real foundations of her fame were laid. There some of her most successful writing was composed, at such an early age, as to make it surprising that so young a woman could have acquired the insight into character, and the nice observation of manners which they display. Pride and Prejudice, which some consider the most brilliant of her novels, was the first finished, if not the first begun. She began it in October 1796, before she was twenty-one years old, and completed it in about ten months, in August 1797. The title, then intended for it, was First Impressions. Sense and Sensibility was begun, in its present form, immediately after the completion of the former, in November, 1797, but something similar in story and character had been written earlier under the title of Eleanor and Marianne, and if, as is probable, a good deal of this earlier production was retained, it must form the earliest specimen of her writing that has been given to the world. Northanger Abbey, though not prepared for the press till 1803, was certainly first composed in 1798. Amongst the most valuable neighbours of the Austins were Mr. and Mrs. Lefroy and their family. He was rector of the adjoining parish of Ash. She was sister to Sir Edgerton Bridges, to whom we are indebted for the earliest notice of Jane Austen that exists. In his autobiography, speaking of his visits at Ash, he writes thus, the nearest neighbours of the Lefroys were the Austens of Steventon. I remember Jane Austen, the novelist, as a little child. She was very intimate with Mrs. Lefroy, and much encouraged by her. 
Her mother was a Miss Lee, whose paternal grandmother was a sister to the first Duke of Chandos. Mr. Austin was of a Kentish family, of which several branches have been settled in the Weald of Kent, and some are still remaining there. When I knew Jane Austen, I never suspected that she was an authoress, but my eyes told me that she was fair and handsome, slight and elegant, but with cheeks a little too full. One may wish that Sir Edgerton had dwelt rather longer on the subject of these memories, instead of being drawn away by his extreme love for genealogies to her great-grandmother and ancestors. That great-grandmother, however, lives in the family records as Mary Bridges, a daughter of Lord Chandos, married in Winchester Abbey to a Theophilus Lee of Adelstrop in 1698. When a girl she had received a curious letter of advice and reproof, written by her mother from Constantinople. Mary, or Paul, was remaining in England with her grandmother, Lady Bernard, who seems to have been wealthy and inclined to be too indulgent to her granddaughter. This letter is given. Any such authentic document, two hundred years old, dealing with domestic details, must possess some interest. This is remarkable, not only as a specimen of the homely language in which ladies of rank then expressed themselves, but from the sound sense which it contains. Forms of expression vary, but good sense and right principles are the same in the nineteenth century than they were in the seventeenth century. My dearest Paul, your letters by cousin Robert Searle arrived here not before the twenty-seventh of April, yet were they heartily welcome to us, bringing you joyful news, which a great while we had longed for, of my most dear mother and all other relations and friends, good health, which I beseech God continue to you all, and as I observe in yours to your sister Betty, your extraordinary kindness of, as I may truly say, the best mother and grandmother in the world, in pinching herself to make you so fine, I cannot but admire her great good housewifery in affording you so very plentiful an allowance, and yet to increase her stock at the rate I find she hath done. And I think I can never sufficiently mind you how very much it is your duty on all occasions to pay her your gratitude, in all humble submissions and obedience to her commands, so long as you live. I must tell you, tis her bounty and care in your greatest measure that you are likely to owe your well living in this world, and as you cannot help but be very sensible you are an extraordinary charge to her, so it behooves you to take particular heed that, in the whole course of your life, you render her a proportional comfort, especially tis your best way you can ever hope to make her such amends as God requires of your hands. But, Paul, it grieves me a little, yet I am forced to take notice and reprove you for some vain expressions in your letters to your sister. You say, concerning your allowance, you aim to bring your bread and cheese even. In this I do not discommend you, for a foul shame indeed it would be should you run out the constable having so liberal a provision made you for your maintenance. But, your reason you give for your resolution, I cannot at all approve for you, to say, to spend more than you can't. That's because you have it not to spend, otherwise it seems you would. So yet, tis your grandmother's discretion and not yours that keeps you from extravagancy, which plainly appears in the close of your sentence, saying, yet you think it simple covetousness, to save out of yours, but tis my opinion, if you lay all on your back, tis ten times a greater sin and shame than to save somewhat out of so large an allowance in your purse to help you at a dead lift. Child, we all know our beginning, but who knows his end? The best use that can be made out of fair weather is to provide against foul, and his great discretion, and of no small commendations for a young woman betimes, to show herself half wifely and frugal. Your mother, neither maid nor wife, ever yet bestowed forty pounds a year on herself. And yet, if you never fall under a worse reputation in the world than she, I thank God for it, hath hitherto done, you need not repine at it, and you cannot be ignorant of the difference that was between my fortune and what you are to expect. You ought likewise to consider that you have seven brothers and sisters, and you are all one man's children, and therefore it is very unreasonable that one should expect to be preferred in finery so much above all the rest, for it is impossible you should so much mistake your father's condition as to fancy he is able to allow every one of you forty pounds a year apiece, for such an allowance, with the charge of their diet over and above, will amount to at least five hundred pounds a year, a sum your 
poor father can ill spare. Besides, do but think yourself what a ridiculous sight it will be when your grandmother and you come to us to have no less than seven waiting gentlewomen in one house. For what reason can you give why every one of your sisters should not have every one of them a maid as well as you, and though you may spare to pay your maid's wages out of your allowance, yet you take no care of the unnecessary charge you put your father to in your increase of his family, whereas, if it were not a piece of pride to have the name of keeping your maid, she yet waits on your good grandmother, might easily do as formerly, you know, she hath done, all the business you have for a maid, unless, as you grow older, you grow a verier fool, which, God forbid. Paul, ye live in a place where you see great plenty and splendor, but let not the allurements of earthly pleasures tempt you to forget or neglect the duty of a good Christian in dressing your better part, which is your soul, as will best please God. I am not against your going decent and neat, as becomes your father's daughter, but to clothe yourself rich and be running into every gaudy fashion can never become your circumstances, and instead of doing you credit and getting you a good preferment, it is the readiest way you can take to fright all sober men from ever thinking of matching themselves with women that live above their fortune, and if this be a wise way of spending money, judge you, and besides, do but reflect what an odd sight it will be to a stranger that comes to our house to see your grandmother, your mother, and all your sisters in a plain dress, and you only tricked up like a Bartholomew baby. You know what sort of people those are that can't fare well, but they must cry roast meat now what effect could you imagine your riding in such a high strain to your sisters could have, but either to provoke them to envy you, or murmur against us. I must tell you, neither of your sisters have ever had twenty pounds a year allowance from us yet, and yet their dress hath not disparaged neither them nor us, without incurring the censure of simple covetousness, they will have some what to show out of their savings that will do them credit, and I expect yet you that their elder sister should rather set them examples of the like nature than tempt them from treading in the steps of their good grandmother and poor mother. This is not half what might be said on this occasion, but believing thee to be a very good-natured, dutiful child, I should have thought it a great deal too much, but yet, having in my coming hither passed through many most desperate dangers, I cannot forbear thinking and preparing myself for all events, and therefore, not knowing how it may please God to dispose of us, I conclude it my duty to God and thee, my dear child, to lay this matter as home to thee as I could, assuring you my daily prayers are not, nor shall be wanting, that God may give you grace always to remember to make a right use of this truly affectionate counsel of your poor mother. And though I speak very plain, downright English to you, yet I would not have you doubt but that I love you as heartily as any child I have, and if you serve God and take good courses, I promise you my kindness to you shall be according to your own heart's desire, for you may be certain I can aim at nothing in what I have now writ, but your real good, which to promote, shall be the study and care day and night. Of my dear Paul, thy truly affectionate mother, Eliza Chandus, Para of Galata, May the 6th, 1686. Postscript. Thy father and I send thee our blessing, and all thy brothers and sisters their service. Our hearty and affectionate service to my brother and sister child, and all my dear cousins. When you see my lady Worcester, and cousin Howlands, pray present them my most humble service. This letter shows that the wealth acquired by trade was already manifesting itself in contrast with the straitened circumstances of some of the nobility. Mary Bridges's poor father, in whose household economy was necessary, was the King of England's ambassador at Constantinople. The grandmother, who lived in great plenty and splendor, was the widow of a turkey merchant. But then, as now, it would seem, rank had the power of attracting and absorbing wealth. At Ash, also, Jane became acquainted with a member of the Lefroy family, who was still living when I began these memoirs a few months ago, the right Honourable Thomas Lefroy, the late Chief Justice of Ireland. One must look back more than seventy years to reach the time when these two bright young persons were, for a short time, 
intimately acquainted with each other, and then separated on their several courses, never to meet again, both destined to attain some distinction in their different ways, one to survive the other for more than half a century, yet in his extreme old age to remember and speak, as he sometimes did, of his former companion, as one to be much admired, and not easily forgotten by those who had ever known her. Mrs. Lefroy herself was a remarkable person. Her rare endowments of goodness, talents, graceful person, and engaging manners were sufficient to secure her a prominent place in any society into which she was thrown, while her enthusiastic eagerness of disposition rendered her especially attractive to a clever and lively girl. She was killed by a fall from her horse on Jane's birthday, December 16, 1804. The following lines to her memory were written by Jane four years afterwards, when she was thirty-three years old. They are given not for their merits as poetry, but to show how deep and lasting was the impression made by the elder friend on the mind of the younger. To the memory of Mrs. Lefroy. The day returns again, my natal day. What mixed emotions in my mind arise! Beloved friend, four years have passed away, since thou wert snatched for ever from our eyes. The day commemorative of my birth, bestowing life and light and hope to me, brings back the hour which was thy last on earth, O oh, bitter pang of torturing memory! Angelic woman, past my power to praise, in language, meet thy talents, temper, mind, thy solid worth, thy captivating grace, thou friend and ornament of humankind. But come, fond fancy, thou indulgent power, hope is desponding, chill, severe to thee, Bless thou this little portion of an hour, let me behold her as she used to be. I see her here with all her smiles benign, her looks of eager love, her accents sweet, that voice and countenance almost divine, expression, harmony, alike complete. Listen, it is not sound alone, tis sense, tis genius, taste, and tenderness of soul, tis genuine warmth of heart without pretense, and purity of mind that crowns the whole. She speaks— "'Tis eloquence, that grace of tongue, so rare, so lovely, never misapplied, by her to palliate vice or deck a wrong. She speaks and argues, but on virtue's side. Hers is the energy of soul sincere. Her Christian spirit, ignorant to feign, seeks but to comfort, heal, enlighten, cheer, confer a pleasure, or prevent a pain. Can aught enhance such goodness? Yes, to me her partial favor from my earliest years consummates all. Ah, give me but to see her smile of love. The vision disappears. Tis past and gone. We meet no more below. Short is the cheat of fancy or the tomb. Oh, might I hope to equal bliss to go to meet thee, angel, in thy future home. Fain would I feel an union with thy fate. Fain would I seek to draw an omen fair. From this connection in our earthly date, indulge the harmless weakness, reason, spare. The loss of their first home is generally a great grief to young persons of strong feeling and lively imagination, and Jane was exceedingly unhappy when she was told that her father, now seventy years of age, had determined to resign his duties to his eldest son, who was to be his successor in the rectory of Steventon, and to remove with his wife and daughters to Bath. Jane had been absent from home when this resolution was taken, and as her father was always rapid both in forming his resolutions and in acting on them, she had little time to reconcile herself to the change. A wish has sometimes been expressed that some of Jane Austen's letters should be published. Some entire letters and many extracts will be given in this memoir, but the reader must be warned not to expect too much from them. With regard to accuracy of language, indeed, every word of them might be printed without correction. The style is always clear and generally animated, while a vein of humor continually gleams through the whole. But the materials may be thought inferior to the execution, for they treat only of the details of domestic life. There is in them no notice of politics or public events, scarcely any discussions on literature or other subjects of general interest. They may be said to resemble the nest which some little bird builds of the materials nearest at hand of the twigs and mosses supplied by the tree in which it is placed, curiously constructed out of the simplest matters. Her letters have seldom the date of the year, or the signature of her Christian name at full length, but it has been easy to ascertain their dates, either from the postmark or from their contents. 
The two following letters are the earliest that I have seen. They were both written in November 1800, before the family removed from Steventon. Some of the same circumstances are referred to in both. The first is to her sister Cassandra, who was then staying with their brother Edward at Godmersham Park, Kent. Steventon, Saturday evening, November 8th. My dear Cassandra, I thank you for so speedy a return to my two last, and particularly thank you for your anecdote of Charlotte Graham and her cousin, Harriet Bailey, which has very much amused both my mother and myself. If you can learn anything farther of that interesting affair, I hope you will mention it. I have two messages. Let me get rid of them, and then my paper will be my own. Mary fully intended writing to you by Mr. Shute's Frank, and only happened entirely to forget it, but will write soon, and my father wishes Edward to send him a memorandum of the price of the hops. The tables are come, and give general contentment. I had not expected that they would so perfectly suit the fancy of us all three, or that we should so well agree in the disposition of them, but nothing except their own surface can have been smoother. The two ends put together form one constant table for everything, and the centerpiece stands most exceedingly well under the glass, and holds a great deal most commodiously, without looking awkwardly. They are both covered with green bays, and send their best love. The Pembroke has got its destination by the sideboard, and my mother has great delight in keeping her money and papers locked up. The little table which used to stand there has most conveniently taken itself off into the best bedroom, and we are now in want only of the chiffonier, which is neither finished nor come. So much for that subject. I now come to another, of a very different nature, as other subjects are very apt to be. Earl Harwood has been again giving uneasiness to his family, and talked to the neighbourhood. In the present instance, however, he is only unfortunate, and not in fault. About ten days ago, in cocking a pistol in the guard-room at Marseilles, he accidentally shot himself through the thigh. Two young Scotch surgeons in the island were polite enough to propose taking off the thigh at once, but to that he would not consent, and accordingly in his wounded state was put on board a cutter and conveyed to Hasler Hospital, at Gosport, where the bullet was extracted, and where he now is, I hope, in a fair way of doing well. The surgeon of the hospital wrote to the family on the occasion, and John Harwood went down to him immediately, attended by James, whose object in going was to be the means of bringing back the earliest intelligence to Mr. and Mrs. Harwood, whose anxious sufferings, particularly those of the latter, have of course been dreadful. They went down on Tuesday, and James came back the next day, bringing such favourable accounts as greatly to lessen the distress of the family at Dean though it will probably be a long while before Mrs. Hardwood can be quite at ease. One most material comfort, however, they have, the assurance of its being really an accidental wound, which is not only positively declared by Earl himself, but is likewise testified by the particular direction of the bullet. Such a wound could not have been received in a duel. At present he is going on very well, but the surgeon will not declare him to be in no danger." Mr. Heathcote met with a genteel little accident the other day in hunting. He got off to lead his horse over a hedge, or a house, or something, and his horse in his haste trod upon his leg, or rather ankle, I believe, and it is not certain whether the small bone is not broke. Martha has accepted Mary's invitation for Lord Portsmouth's ball. He has not yet sent out his own invitations, but that does not signify. Martha comes, and a ball there is to be. I think it will be too early in her mother's absence for me to return with her. Sunday evening. We have had a dreadful storm of wind in the fore part of this day, which has done a great deal of mischief among our trees. I was sitting alone in the dining-room when an odd kind of crash startled me. In a moment afterwards it was repeated. I then went to the window, which I reached just in time to see the last of our two highly valued elms descend into the sweep. The other, which had fallen, I suppose, in the first crash, and which was the nearest to the pond, taking a more easterly direction, sunk among our screen of chestnuts and firs, knocking down one spruce fir, beating off the head of another, and stripping the two corner chestnuts of several branches in its fall. This is not all. One large elm out of the two on the left-hand side, as you enter what I call the elm walk, was likewise blown down. The maple bearing the weather crook was broken too, and what I regret more than all the rest is, that the three elms which grew in Hall's Meadow, and gave such ornament to it, are gone, 
two blown down, and the other so much injured that it cannot stand. I am happy to add, however, that no greater evil than the loss of trees has been the consequence of the storm in this place, or in our immediate neighborhood. We grieve, therefore, in some comfort. I am yours ever, J. A. The next letter, written four days later than the former, was addressed to Miss Lloyd, an intimate friend, whose sister, my mother, was married to Jane's eldest brother. Steventon, Wednesday evening, November 12th. My dear Martha, I did not receive your note yesterday till after Charlotte had left Dean, or I would have sent my answer by her, instead of being the means, as I now must be, of lessening the elegance of your new dress for the Hurst-Horn Ball by the value of threepence. You are very good in wishing to see me at Ibthorpe so soon, and I am equally good in wishing to come to you. I believe our merit in that respect is much upon a par, our self-denial mutually strong. Having paid this tribute of praise to the virtue of both, I shall here have done with a panegyric, and proceed to plain matter of fact. In about a fortnight's time I hope to be with you. I have two reasons for not being able to come before. I wish to so arrange my visit as to spend some days with you after your mother's return, in the first place that I may have the pleasure of seeing her, and in the second that I may have a better chance of bringing you back with me. Your promise in my favor was not quite absolute, but if your will is not perverse, you and I will do all in our power to overcome your scruples of conscience. I hope we shall meet next week to talk this all over, till we have tired ourselves with the very idea of my visit before my visit begins. Our invitations for the 19th are arrived, and very curiously are they worded. Mary mentioned you yesterday, poor Earl's unfortunate accident, I dare say. He does not seem to be going on very well. The two or three last posts have brought less and less favorable accounts of him. John Harwood has gone to Gosport again to-day. We have two families of friends now who are in a most anxious state, for though by a note from Catherine this morning there seems now to be a revival of hope at many down, its continuous may be too reasonably doubted. Mr. Heathcote, however, who has broken the small bone of his leg, is so good as to be going on very well. It would be really too much to have three people to care for. You distress me cruelly by your request about books. I cannot think of any to bring with me, nor have I any idea of our wanting them. I come to you to be talked to, not to read or hear reading. I can do that at home, and, indeed, I am now laying in a stock of intelligence to pour out on you as my share of the conversation. I am reading Henry's History of England, which I will repeat to you in any manner you may prefer, either in a loose, dulcetory, unconnected stream, or dividing my recitals, as the historian divides it himself, into seven parts, the civil and military, religion, constitution, learning and learned men, arts and sciences, commerce, coins and shipping, and manners, so that for every evening in the week there will be a different subject. The Friday's lot, commerce, coins and shipping, you will find the least entertaining, but the next evening's portion will make amends. With such a provision on my part, if you will do yours by repeating the French grammar, and Mrs. Stent will now and then ejaculate some wonder about the cocks and hens, what can we want? Farewell for a short time. We all unite in best love, and I am your very affectionate J. A. The two letters must have been written early in 1801, after the removal from Steventon had been decided on, but before it had taken place. They refer to the two brothers who were at sea, and give some idea of the kind of anxieties and uncertainties to which sisters are seldom subject in these days of peace, steamers, and electric telegraphs. At that time ships were often wind-bound or becalmed, or driven wide of their destination, and sometimes they had orders to alter their course for some secret service, not to mention the chance of conflict with the vessel of superior power, no improbable occurrence before the Battle of Trafalgar. Information about relatives on board men of war was scarce and scanty, and often picked up by hearsay or chance means, and every scrap of intelligence was proportionably valuable. My dear Cassandra, I should not have thought it necessary to write to you so soon, but for the arrival of a letter from Charles to myself. It was written last Saturday from off the start, and conveyed to Popham Lane by Captain Boyle on his way to Midgham. He came from Lisbon in the Endymion. I will copy Charles an account of his conjectures about Frank. He has not seen my brother lately, nor does he expect to find him arrived, as he met Captain Inglis at Rhodes, going up to take command of the petrel, as he was coming down, 
but supposes he will arrive in less than a fortnight from this time, in some ship which is expected to reach England about that time, with dispatches from Sir Ralph Abercrombie. The event must show what sort of a conjurer Captain Boyle is. The Endymion has not been plagued with any more prizes. Charles spent three pleasant days in Lisbon. They were very well satisfied with their royal passenger, whom they found jolly and affable, who talks of Lady Augusta as his wife, and seems much attached to her. When this letter was written, the Endymion was becalmed, but Charles hoped to reach Portsmouth by Monday or Tuesday. He received my letter, communicating our plans, before he left England, was much surprised, of course, but is quite reconciled to them, and means to come to Steventon once more, while Steventon is ours." from a letter written later in the same year. Charles has received thirty pounds for his share of the privateer, and expects ten pounds more, but of what avail is it to take prizes if he lays out the produce in presents to his sisters? He has been buying gold chains and topaz crosses for us. He must be well scolded. The Endymion has already received orders for taking troops to Egypt, which I should not at all like if I did not trust to Charles being removed from her somehow or other before she sails. He knows nothing of his own destination, he says, but desires me to write directly, as the Endymion will probably sail in three or four days. He will receive my yesterday's letter, and I shall write again by this post to thank and reproach him. We shall be unbearably fine. End of chapter 3